Unfortunately, I have some very sad news to share with you. My heart is pained because um, there's some truth that has been hidden that needs to come to the light. Uh, I know that you are unaware and you've been believing a lie in a certain area. And, and the news is going to be alarming. And I know that some of you will be tempted not to believe me. And some of you will be tempted to walk out because you're not going to face this truth. Wrestling is fake. I know. I, I was once where you were at. I believed a lie. As a young boy, I grew up, and if you grew up in Texas, you watched uh, cartoons early on Saturday morning, and right after cartoons, you watched wrestling, right? How many of you watched wrestling growing up? Like, I don't watch wrestling now. I watched wrestling back in the day, when it, in the 80s, when they like, how many of you remember watching Hulk Hogan? How about if, if in Texas you knew about the Von Erich family, right? Kerry Von Erich, his brothers Mike and Kevin. What, were, what move, what signature move were they famous for? The Iron Claw. That's right. That's right. And then there was uh, the Junkyard Dog, right? Nobody was better than the bone than the Junkyard Dog. You had Rowdy Rowdy Piper and then Nature Boy Ric Flair. If you believed wrestling was fake, or if you believed that it was real, regardless, would you just look over at your neighbor and give a little bit of a, a nature boy Ric Flair woo, right? Woo! Some of y'all had no idea you could be as Pentecostal as you are. <laughs> but I once believed a lie. I thought that wrestling was real. Conversely, some of you have been told that your spiritual fight is fake. That it's not real. In fact, the enemy, I believe that one of the biggest lies that he's ever told is that he is fake. That he is not real. That it is not a real spiritual fight. And the reality is, it is. You are at war. You are in a real spiritual fight. And your physical weapons are not any good in a spiritual war. You need spiritual weapons in a spiritual fight against a real spiritual enemy. Turn with me in your Bibles to the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 6. I'm so glad that you're here as we continue our series called The Art of War. Every single week we are discovering a specific armor of God that the Lord gives us as an extension to his strength for us in our fight against the enemy. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? But we wrestle against spiritual forces. In week one we discovered about the shield of faith. The shield of Faith helps us to extinguish every fiery arrow of the enemy. He's going to lie. He's going to tempt you. He's going to try to make you afraid. He's going to try to make you worry. And that's why it's important to have the shield of faith, to have the, the helmet of salvation, to protect your mind so you would think correct, truthful thoughts about who God is and about who you are in God. That you, your identity is a child of God, right? It doesn't matter what the world says. It matters what God says. And that we believe that. And we need to understand that. And that is saving truth for each of us. So let's look at the word of God to discover the next piece of armor as we armor up, as we become stronger for battle. Because the good news is, is that our commander in chief is victorious. Amen. We are on the winning side. And so we don't have to be afraid. We just need to armor up and be ready so we can be more victorious. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on how much of that armor? The whole armor of God. That you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand, withstand in the evil day. Some of you are there right now. You feel like today is that day. You are facing attacks from the enemy. He's coming after your mind, your soul. He's attacking your marriages, your children, your health, your finances. And you don't need to shrink back. You don't need to run away. You need to endure, armor up, be strong, hold your ground. 
It says, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, and having put on what? The breastplate of righteousness. When the Bible compares the armor of God with military gear, each piece is essential to your success. Each piece is important that you're that you would be able to stand strong during the evil day. It's part of God's strength that he extends to us when we become his children. And so Paul is writing to this church of Ephesus, and he's using this imagery of this Roman soldier, someone who they would have seen in the, very, in the first century. And he's saying, this is what you need to look like spiritually. This, you need to have the armor of God. You need to have spiritual weapons so you can overcome the enemy because you're going to have trials. You're going to have adversity. There's going to be temptation. There's going to be attacks. So be ready. Be alert. And so there's three questions that we are going to answer. Three simple answers to help you understand the role of the breastplate of righteousness. First, you're going to understand and discover what it is. Second, why it's important. And third, how do you put it on? How do you put it on? First, what is the breastplate of righteousness? Well, the armor, a, a Roman soldier would have, would have carried about 70 pounds of armor on them. And most of that weight would have come from the, the breastplate. And the breastplate covered the, just the key area from the neck to the waist to cover the, the vital organs, namely the heart, right? The, the breastplate covers and protects the heart. It's so important to understand that. Uh, Righteousness is, is what it's symbolic of. The breastplate is symbolic of righteousness, but it's, it's there to protect the heart. A few years ago, a letter was given to me here at the church. It was a death threat, uh, and we met together with our safety team and our pastors. We prayed. We cons consulted with a couple of our police officers, and they recommended that I take the following Sunday off. Now, I, I, after praying, I didn't feel like I wanted to do that. I didn't want to give in to just a threat. But they said, well, at a minimum, wear a bulletproof vest. And the bulletproof vest is like the modern-day uh, modern breastplate. And so on a Sunday a few years ago, you guys weren't aware, unless you gave me a hug and you felt it on me. I unfortunately wasn't as strong as I wish I was. But uh, I had this bulletproof vest to protect my vital organs in case the worst case happened, but really it was to give my wife some peace of mind. <laughs> uh, but the reality is the threat never came to fruition. And isn't that what it's mostly like? Like most of the time, it's not the actual fiery arrow. It's the threat of it, that the enemy tries to lie. He tries to distract you. He tries to worry you. And he tries to come after your mind and your heart. Why does he try to come after your heart? Because it's most important. If our heart gets taken out physically, then we go. And it's the same thing spiritually. And that's why it's so important to protect the heart. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Notice it says everything that you do flows from it. So the breastplate protects your heart. And the Bible says that the, the breastplate is a symbol, again, of what? Righteousness. The word righteousness is a common word in the Bible. It's a spiritual word that's used and misused so many times. You may just have a very vague understanding of what righteousness is. But quite simply, righteousness means right living. Righteousness means right living. It's what you do. It's more than just who you are. It's what you do. So it's choosing to do the next right thing in your life. As you live out righteousness, it's choosing to do what's right, what's wise, what's most loving, no matter what the cost, no matter the pressure, no matter if you don't meet other people's expectations, it's doing the next right thing. It's doing what's sexually pure, 
it's saying the right thing. It's regarding your talk. It affects how you give and spend your money. It's doing what's wise, and it's not conforming to the world's standards. Because the world would say what is right and what is wrong. But how many of you guys know, as, as children of God, as, as soldiers in his army, we define what is right based on the word of God and the character of God. And we come under this umbrella of, a, of, of protection. And not only when we live our lives in a way that is right and pleasing according to his righteousness, we're going to be covered and protected, but we will also have his blessing and favor. So it's important to understand what righteousness is. Noah Webster defined righteousness as purity of heart and rectitude of life, conformity of heart and life to the divine law. It includes all that we call justice, honesty, and virtue. With holy affections, in short, it is true religion. Charles Spurgeon once said, Righteousness is the breastplate of the Christian soldier. It is the first and most essential piece of armor that he puts on. Without it, he cannot stand against the attacks of the enemy. So righteousness... Your right living according to God's standard and holiness and righteousness will protect you. Now, unfortunately, some of you are not protected because you're not living rightly. Your unrighteousness, maybe in a specific area of your life, is opening yourself up to the attacks of the enemy. And as a result, you are opening yourself up to a real spiritual enemy that wants to oppress you, wants to attack you, wants to get a, a stronghold in your life that will distract you, that will call, keep you from growing in your spiritual walk with God, keep you from growing in close fellowship with the Lord, keep you from fulfilling God's purposes in your life to be fruitful. And so the Lord sees you, and he wants you to be strong in your faith. He wants to have a good relationship with you that's close and intimate with the Lord. He wants you to fulfill his kingdom purpose in your life. And that can only do when, do happen when you are living rightly with God. And that does not mean you're perfect. I mean, we have flesh. We have bodies that we're going to have to manage the tension. That we're, we're going to be tempted, right? And when we miss the mark, we do not need to give up. We do not need to be defeated. But we need to come under the submission of the Lord and confess our sins to the Lord and ask God to forgive us and then we just desire to walk into his righteousness, not our own. In fact, it's, it's important to understand that Proverbs 13, 6 says, Righteousness guards the person of integrity, but wickedness overthrows the sinner. So this breastplate of righteousness refers to a righteousness that is purchased by Christ at the cross. It's not our own righteousness. It's a righteousness of God. It's a righteousness of Christ. And so at the moment of salvation, the moment that we understand that Jesus died on the cross, that we put our full trust, faith in him, we confess our sin, repent of our sin, turn to God, at that moment we are saved. At that moment we don't earn salvation, but we receive salvation and we receive this breastplate of righteousness that has the seals of Christ on it. And it's extended to us that we can put on to protect us. So here's some things, three things that I want you to understand about righteousness. First, righteousness can be faked. It can be faked. God who sees everything is not fooled. The enemy is not fooled. And so we must deal seriously with sin. Jesus didn't come so you can excuse or manage sin. Jesus came and died on the cross so that your sin can be put to death, that you can be victorious over sin. Jesus didn't come. He didn't come and die so we can continue to practice unrighteousness. He died that we would be righteous in our practice. 1 John 1.6 says, and it's very clear, if we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. For some of us, we're not protected, we're not strong in battle because we've opened ourselves up, because we're walking in a way that's not right before God. We're not walking in a way that is in the light, but rather in the darkness. Some of you, you were very sincere on the day that you surrendered your life to Jesus. 
and he has become your Savior. But I ask you, has he become Lord over every area of your life? There's more references in your Bible of Jesus being Lord than being Savior. He wants to be both. He is both. But when he is Lord, you're saying, I surrender every area of my life. There's nothing in secret. There's nothing that's unrighteous. I surrender it. I confess it. I give it to the Lord. Now, righteousness can't be faked. It's a self-righteousness. And if you've ever truly been around a self-righteous person, they can have the appearance that they're righteous, but they're righteous in their own eyes. And it's usually rooted in pride. They are always right. Everybody else is always wrong. In Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector who went to the temple to pray. Do you remember that story that Jesus taught? He was trying to tell us a, a spiritual meaning about righteousness. And he says this Pharisee, this religious leader, got up and he began to pray out loud. He said, I'm glad I'm not like that tax collector. He began to compare himself, that he's better than other people. He's like, I tithe, I fast, I, I pray and, but I'm not like this other person. And then this tax collector gets up and, 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 and he humbles himself and he says simply, Lord, be merciful for on me, for I am just a sinner. And then Jesus says, which one went home justified? It was the tax collector. It was a tax collector because he, his righteousness was found in God. He was broken. He was humble and had a contrite spirit. One of the Puritans, John Downham, said this, This breastplate of righteousness is a good conscience, true sanctification, and a godly life. So it's a practical holiness. Holiness means to be set apart. And so the, the Lord wants us to be set apart from the world. He wants to be set apart to him, that we would reflect the righteousness of God in the way we talk, in the way we act, in the way that we think that our desires, affections would be righteous after the Lord. There's a second thing about righteousness that is important to understand. Second is that righteousness is not so much a state of being, but a state of doing. It's what you do that matters. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 9, it says, Whomever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned and from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So again, righteousness is not just a state of being, but rather it's a state of doing. And so your works, your acts, the way you talk, when you're born again, you reflect the character of God. And it's not in your own strength, it's in the strength of God. It's in his grace, in his righteousness that he sees that you begin to depend upon as you walk in the spirit, that your identity is in Christ and so that you would look like him in every area of your life for his glory, for his righteousness. The third important truth about righteousness is that righteousness is embraced, not earned. You cannot earn righteousness. Here's a little theology because it's very important. Righteousness is both imputed and imparted. These are terms you may have heard of and not fully understood, and they're important as it relates to righteousness. So what does this mean? Imputed. Righteousness is given at the moment of salvation. When you are truly born again and you become the, a new creation that that you receive the righteousness of God. And this is called justification. Just as if I had never sinned. And that's how God sees you. He sees his righteousness, that you are cleansed, you are forgiven, you are set free. He remembers your sin no longer. Isn't that good news? That on the day of our salvation, that we are set free, that we become a child of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he 
made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the what? The righteousness of God in him. So you can't earn the righteousness of God just like you can't earn salvation. And then you can't, from that moment going forward, you cannot earn or work for his favor for that, for that righteousness. 1 Peter 2.24 said, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So how do we live in that? It's imparted righteousness. It's worked out every day after salvation that the Lord gives us his righteousness as we seek it, as we become dependent upon it. So both righteousness is imputed and imparted. It's both instantaneous and then it's progressive as we grow in sanctification, grow in our knowledge, grow in our relationship with Jesus. So why do we need it? We need it for protection. We need it to protect our hearts, our bodies, our soul, our mind. But it doesn't just stop there. How do we put it on? We put it on quite simply. And if the whole message, this sermon, could be boiled down to one statement, it would be to seek the Lord's righteousness and to sin less. This is how we embrace the righteousness of God. We first seek his righteousness. Matthew chapter 6, verse, the verse 33 says, First seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? And then everything else is going to work out. In Matthew 5, one of the Beatitudes, it says, To hunger and thirst for what? For righteousness, and we will be filled. So every day when we wake up, it's a new day that we should seek the righteousness of God. We should seek the presence of God. We should seek to walk after him in every area of our life. It should be a joy, not burdensome. It's something that we get to do to reflect the character of God in our life, to reflect his grace, his spirit as we walk in the spirit. This is what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus, to seek his righteousness. But there comes a point that we've got to say no. We've got to crucify the flesh. We've got to say no to sin, to put it to death. And quite simply, we've got to say no to sin. So that puts it to death means being ruthless when it comes to eliminating the stronghold that the enemy tries to tempt us with in our own life. We've got to be serious about sin and understand that righteousness transforms us from the inside out. Transformation happens little by little. So the more that we're in relationship with the Lord, the more we seek his righteousness, the more we spend time in his word, the more we spend time in community with our brothers and sisters and the family of God, the more that we're going to grow and learn to have his imparted righteousness in us, to protect us, to live rightly for his glory. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24 says, That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So righteousness is what I receive when I'm saved, but it's given to me and it grows. And so we wear the breastplate of righteousness. It protects our heart that flows out everything that we do. Little by little that we grow to be more like him. Romans six thirteen says, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. And so what area of your life is not righteous? What area of your life that you think is hidden, that is secret, that, is, that does not reflect the righteousness of our Lord? For some of you, you're not walking in purity. You're walking in sexual immorality. You've opened yourself up to the enemy. And you need to do some very practical things. And you need to say no and resist the enemy. Some of you very practically just need to start deleting some apps on your phone that's opened itself up for lust. For those of you who have pride in your life, you need to put off and, 
and, and destroy and deny your flesh and to walk in the humility of God. Instead of walking in your own strength, walk in the grace and strength of the Lord. If you've been greedy, if you've envied, have been a person of jealousy, put off the old flesh, deny yourself, and to put on the breastplate of righteousness that you would be more generous of your time, of your finances to God and to others. Men, some of your prayers are being hindered because of how you treat your spouse. You need to treat your spouse rightly to serve her as Christ has served the church. And the Bible says in 1 Peter that when you start treating your wife and your, your children rightly before the Lord, then he's going to answer your prayers. You're going to grow spiritually. You're going to grow stronger as a man of God. This is what the Lord desires. 